He brought something really new to, to this sport. He was unbelievably strong and fit, and he could charge the whole race. He was a professional in everything he did, but that's because he was a professional in life. You know, David and I really felt like we took Supercross to another level. His style, his grace, and his, his sheer personality. I mean, those other guys were heroes, but Bailey, I mean, he was like Cary Grant. For a guy like David, we always thought, you know, somebody else would get hurt, but we thought he would be the last one it would happen to, and uh, unfortunately, it, it did happen. This guy's the best, the smoothest, never crashes, and now he got hurt and paralyzed. David had ups and downs, you know, he had to pick himself up and regroup and deal with the situation head on. What David achieved on a motorcycle is legendary. Does it surprise me what David's done after his injury? No, not a bit. But more importantly, what he achieved after his accident is just as impressive. He became an icon on ESPN. He won the Hawaii Triathlon, became a proud father, and he continues to be the icon of American motocross. The first time I rode a motorcycle was out in the desert. I was about eight years old and all the grown-ups had gotten together and parked all the motorhomes and so the kids would ride around on the pit bikes and I was already pretty good on my bicycle I thought but the first time I rode a motorcycle there was something going on inside of me that said you need to keep doing this, keep pursuing this and I felt like I was going places so I stuck with it and I was having a good time and knew that I would end up reaching my goals. It was just a feeling that I had. You know, when I was about 15, 16, doing the amateur national championship events, I felt like there that if I had put in the work and took it serious, that I could make a career of it. After signing with Honda in 1982, that's when things really started to take off for me because I knew I was on the best bike with the best team and a rider who had a lot to do with me even wanting to race in the first place. Roger DeCosta was now my team manager. I think he was the first rider that really figured out that uh, to slow down, to go faster, he figured that out before anybody else. And to make things better, the very next year, they signed Bob Hanna. So I had two of the people that helped me, besides my father, get involved in motocross to begin with. One's my teammate, one's the manager. That was the season, thanks to an injury from Bob, that I won everything. From there, I got the confidence to just keep on winning. Once you win one, you know you can do it again. So uh, having a teammate over there like Bob early on and then Johnny O'Mara, we started training, and, which was a neat experience because it led to some training and things after motocross. And it's always important when you retire from something that was so big part of your life, to have a little something else to do so you don't just fall off that cliff when you retire. It's unlikely you'll find a greater collection of talent than what Team Honda was in the mid-1980s. Bob Hurricane Hanna, Johnny O'Mara, Ronnie Lachine, and of course Ricky Johnson. Those guys were the New York Yankees of motocross. David and I really felt like we took Supercross to another level, you know, in the early 80s. You know, we clicked so good, we were both innovators of the sport, we both had a lot of respect for each other's riding. The three of us were the 250 and 500 assault guys. In 1986, I won the opening round, we had a great Supercross season, Rick Johnson edged me out there and in the 250 outdoor title as well, then I won the 500 title at the end of the year. There hasn't been a group of talent like that since, and if you could find a singular moment when those guys reached the true zenith, it's the 1986 Motocross of Nations in Majoria, Italy. They came together and they absolutely destroyed the notion that anyone other than Americans were the best in motocross at that time. Won the Motocross of Nations, we had a perfect score. Uh, went home from that, got married. I mean, it, it couldn't really be going any better. Went over to the Ironman during a honeymoon and decided I was going to do that someday when I was through racing. Went home two months later, went over the bars, got hurt. Doctor says, you're never going to walk again. A goal I always had from a kid and when I started doing well and when I was winning was what every athlete wants to do and that's go out on top. I 
I wasn't specific about how I wanted that to happen, and it in fact happened after my best year. Which was definitely a big blow to me personally. I probably have to say that I was never the same after David's injury. Time heals things and you, you keep going, but yeah, it was, it was a tough time. I wouldn't say reality set in, it was more like, you know, the, the farthest thing from it for me because I'm like, okay, well, I'll just get better. What had made me so successful and so consistent before with my ability to, to deal with adversity was now my greatest enemy because I thought I could just get out of the situation. It had been a couple years of just uh, pity party complaining and I was dragging a new wife through that and a new child. When I moved to California I met Jim Kanab, a former pole vaulter injured in you know, a street bike accident. He took over uh, pretty much the helm of winning all the wheelchair races. He got me involved in that and then all of a sudden that goal I had of being an Ironman finisher started to kind of creep back up. So I said I was going to do it. And, you know, people are like, I don't know if that's a good idea. And uh, of course that just, that just made it more appealing, really. <laughs> I figured I could finish the first year. I got third out of four. The second year I went back, got second. I was leading and felt I should have won. Had some physical issues and had to pull off. But the last year, uh, mentally I was ready to win. The guy I had to beat was a former Navy SEAL who'd won the previous two years. And on paper, he's the better man. But my friend Todd said, it, look, he's just a man, and you'd be tougher. Finally caught him on a day when he just had nothing left, and I did, and, and the last six miles of a, you know, 140.6 in ridiculous conditions was actually easy for me. Because I thought about that whole journey. I'd finally accomplished a goal. I'd done something like I had done in motocross, only finishing the Ironman and winning it was bigger than any title that I had for motocross. As important to me as the racing aspect and results was just the idea that we're, we're basically performers, and we're entertainers. So it, it mattered the style that I rode with, the way that I raced others, and what I wore. That's what I loved about working at JT. It was really cool to get involved on the other side of the fence from the competition with designing how that's gonna look in competition. I met David at JT Racing when I was at the time an uh, art director. John Gregory, the owner, just to say, hey, you know, Mark, um, David Bailey is coming down. He's, he's probably going to work with you for a little bit. I was like, really? That's when we were both just learning computers and we started working on a few projects and he was just amazing. It's really cool to have that relationship with Mark and to see that he's got that same passion for some of the gear from the past. JT was the best gear, is what everyone wanted to wear. I came up with this bright orange deal. They wanted it to be for Brock Lover, who had worn pink the year before at a Supercross in LA. They wanted to do something else, and Brock wasn't into it. And uh, so I saw the material laying on the floor, and it was super bright fluorescent orange, and the Rose Bowl Supercross was coming up that weekend, last round. And I said, you make that for me, and I'll wear it. When that orange gear came out, I don't think anybody thought that it would have the impact that it had. First you thought, whoa, you know, what is that? And uh, is anybody going to wear that? You know, I had to race against that stuff. It was so bright and so flamboyant, but that's what David wanted. He created a, a style, basically. When we started doing helmets, we had this idea of doing a replica helmet. And I said, why don't we do some graphics with that? And it was a nice kit. And it worked well, it was successful. We raised some money and, and bought some neck protection for some people. And even at the time, I had already some, some gear design done. And uh, we didn't make gear at the time. But, um, you know, I kept that in, into the drawing boards. Then I get an email from Mark saying, okay, so we're making gear now. We just started to look at some design and I'm like, you know, this could be another cool way to bring David in. This time to have a different twist to the cause. Together we come up with this outfit and I can't wait to see what it looks like on the track. When I was talking to Mark about the design a couple of times, he actually corrected me and said, yeah, 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 that'll be cool. But what's cool is that we're going to be able to help a lot of people. Last year, everything changed. The market, the industry, the sport. At One Industries, we're focused on growing our business, but I wanted to take a step back and do something to help people a little less fortunate than the people that work at One. Mark and David ultimately ended up designing a full range of apparel, a pant, a jersey and gloves, and a brand new helmet. The idea behind this is that we will sell those products and we will donate every penny generated from the sale of those products 
to David's cause. The David Bailey Project is meant not to help David Bailey. It's David Bailey's way to help others who are not as fortunate as him after their accidents. To remember that era, to remember David Bailey, to remember fluorescent orange and bright blue, and for such a great cause, I think it's awesome for the industry. Many times we just keep taking, we try to drive our businesses forward, we try to make more and more money, but sometimes we need to take a step back and realize how fortunate we are. And when I spend time with David, I realize how fortunate I am, how fortunate the people at our company are, and this really is our way of giving something back. When I heard how they wanted to bring this gear about in a limited edition to help people take the money that they make from this gear and go find people and make a big difference in their lives. So I want to make it my goal with one's help to go find these people and give them a nice chunk of money. And I know what it feels like to have a little bit of support, a little bit of financial support, and man, it starts the ball rolling to where the results are immeasurable. So to be able to get that ball rolling with a really cool set of gear and a great concept is, is uh, mandatory. He's a true champion. To do what he did, uh, coming back and do the Iron Mans and all that, is, it shows how much uh, willpower, how much character he has. It didn't surprise me. Whatever David wanted to do, he still could do it. Those things mean a lot to David, and they should. I mean, if you take David Bailey's life after the injury, it's phenomenal. I mean, he's my hero. Even though David Bailey's been in a wheelchair for the last 24 years, you have to say he's much more of a man and stands taller now than he ever did. When I look back, there's not a championship or a race or, a, or something that I didn't get to do. I either did all the races, won them all, rode for the best team. Everything I, I dreamed of as a kid, plus some more, already happened. So when I look back at my career, that's what I'm most proud of. I have not yet been